Hey, good evening there. Welcome to Prog Monster, a site dedicated to progressive rock, hard rock, heavy metal, and other forms of rock music. Anyways, we're here to do our series again. Um, it's supposed to be out this morning, of course, but weekends are tougher to do because so many things to do. So it gets out, but it sometimes gets out fairly late. Anyways, uh, first thing I wanted to say about the series is that we're on episode 32 1995 now I know that I incorrectly said on the last video that it was episode 30 1994 but it was actually episode 31 1994 um, I did mark it in the in the list everything so everything else was fine it was just I for some reason said it that way I'm not really sure why perhaps I got confused uh, happens when you're older <laughs> some people would say it's a normal state of mind at that point Anyways, we're here to talk about two musicians who I've had a little bit of listening to. Not a lot. I've heard some of their stuff. I don't know a lot of their stuff. But um, I think they're pretty pr prominent in their fields. So I thought it would be good to do both of them. We're talking about Rory Gallagher, Irish uh, guitar player. And uh, <clears throat> Jerry Garcia of The Grateful Dead. Now... Originally, when I started today, I had somebody else down for, uh, sorry, I've got a hair and I'm not really figuring it out where it is. Um, originally, I had somebody else in mind as the number two guy uh, instead of Rory Gallagher, but at the last minute I said, you know what, you got to do Rory Gallagher, you're Irish, he's Irish, and Irish people don't have enough, there's not enough Irish guys out there in the rock music industry. So wanted to give some attention to that. So anyway, so we're going to start off with Roy since he passed away first. My normal way of doing it is whoever passed away first gets to go first. That's the way it is. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm going to need my glasses. Here we are. Anyways, we'll give his vitals first. He was born March the 2nd, 1940 um, in, uh, sorry, did I write that right? I don't think I did. One second. Sorry, 1948. Can't even read my own writing. Anyways, he was born in Ballyshannon, Ireland. He died June the 14th, 1995, at the age of 47 in London, England. He was primarily a blues, rock, folk, and jazz musician. Those were the main genres that he was involved with. Um... He was inter his instruments were primarily guitar and vocals, but he, he however did learn to play the banjo, the mandolin, um, the alto saxophone, and I think there was something else too. I'll remember it after. And oh, and the sitar, which was the instrument of Brian jo uh, Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones. Anyways, he learned to play them to all to varying degrees of um, of uh, proficiency, I guess. Um, anyways, he was active from 1963 through to his death in 1995. His family, his mother, Monica, was a singer locally where she was in some of the stage stuff. His father, Daniel, uh, also played the accordion. So he did have some musical instruments and they actually f kind of encouraged it in their family. Uh, and he also had a brother, Donnell, D-O-N-A-L, Gallagher, who eventually became his manager. I could have a drink if you don't mind. So anyways, he got his first guitar at nine. I assume it was acoustic. They didn't really say, but I think it was acoustic because he's, uh, shortly after that, he got at um, 12, he got another, another guitar, which he bought himself. His first, I'm assuming it was his first electric guitar. And then three years after that, when he was 16, he bought a Fender Stratocaster, which was the guitar that he was most known for, most notable guitar for him. Um, initially, um, apparently he was in the skiffle, which was very common at that time in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so he got into that first, but then... He developed an interest in 
Buddy Holly and Eddie Cochran, and then his main influence was by Muddy Waters. So he had a real bluesy influence, and these are the ones that influenced him into playing the music he played. Uh, as he progressed along, um, okay, yeah, as he progressed along, he became interested in. Uh, I just want to make sure I read this name right. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Woody Guthrie and um, also Bed Lead Belly and some others as well. So he, he progressed and got very much into the genre altogether. He, uh, again, he, like I said, he developed an interest in other instruments to which he had varying degrees of um, proficiency, I guess. Um, he formed a band, or he joined a band called Fontana, in which... Uh, he, uh, over time, influenced and changed into an R&B group. And then, uh, after a while, he decided to leave the band, him and Oliver Tobin, the bass player, and the drummer, Johnny Campbell. Uh, they all decided to form their own power trio and called Taste. So that was the first official band that he was in. And I believe they made... They may have made four albums, two studio albums and two... Um, live albums, if I'm correct. Um, uh, I'm just looking at my notes here. Okay, so he did, um, he did, uh, perform at the Marquee Club, kind of playing in the wake of the Cream, and then he actually went on tour, uh, backing, uh, Blind Faith with, uh, Taste. Anyways. The band broke up after their performance um, at the Isle of Wight. Um, so they reached their epitome, epitome at the um, Isle of Wight. And the year later, after they broke up, they also released a live album from the Isle of Wight. But he, event, he, w he went solo at this point. And over the next decade or two, over the next decade, he, he released 10, al 10 studio albums and a couple of live albums. And he also released stuff in the 1980s as well, but he wasn't as proficient or prolific as he was in the 70s. Not many people were. Was, people were producing albums a lot in the, in the 70s. Anyways, um, at that point, um, he uh, uh, he was... He, his. The, the group, his solo stuff, had sold over 30 million copies, and he was very pretty big in Ireland, but he didn't have uh, a huge amount of following or superstar status at that point in time. Um, perhaps if he'd been more globally, he might have had that superstar status, but he he was a superstar in Ireland for sure, no doubt about it. Um uh, basically, he and Van Morrison and Thin Lizzy were the best of the uh, that the Irish had to offer over the course of that time period. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to say about him is he he died of a liver transplant. Basically, he developed a basically he developed a fear of flying, and they gave him uh, a type of sedative to calm him while he was flying because he flew a lot because he's a musician. He had, before you have to go from town to town or place to place play so anyways um this narcotic that he was prescribed um eventually had serious side effects on his liver and that along with his drinking so his drinking and this sedative uh, kind of damaged his liver to the point where the the um when he was taken to the hospital, they pretty much figured he had to have a liver trance almost immediately, or he wasn't going to make it. So he was—he had the liver transplant. It was successful, and they put him in um, what do they call it? Um, well, he's put in to recover for. He was in there in oh intensive care. That's what it was. He's was in intensive care for about ten to thirteen weeks, and he was doing very well up to a certain point. And in the last couple of weeks, he. He contracted MRSA, which is understandable considering that the drugs they uh, have to give him to 
for a, for a transplant of any kind, they have to give you these drugs to suppress your natural immunity system because it'll immediately want to attack this foreign body. And while it was doing that, the MRSA got in there and uh, he went downhill very quickly and then he died. Um, and this is not really that uncommon with this type of thing. So anyways, that's how he died. He passed. He was 47. So my personal things about Roy Gallagher, I've heard a lot about him. I've listened to some of his guitar. He's quite a good guitar player. Um, he's won some awards for his guitar playing. I don't think he's... To me, personally, I don't think he's in the same kind of league as, uh, say, uh, who's somebody who I think is similar to him. Oh, um, you know, I don't think he's in the same league as, like, a Jimmy Page or anything like that, but definitely has, like, really good abilities. Um, um, and But he plays in a genre of music, blues, that I kind of... I listen to blues, but... You know, I'm kind of hit and miss with that. It's not something I regularly listen to. I'd say if you were to give it a percentage, I'd say about 10% of the time I might listen to some bluesy stuff, which isn't a lot. So he wasn't one of the people I listened to a lot. So I've, I've heard his stuff, of course. I think he's pretty solid. Um, and you know what? I um, The way things are going now, I could see myself buying something of his and maybe getting into it. Um, now, having uh, read about him, too, I think I have an interest in hearing some of the stuff that he put out in the 70s, especially. So, anyways, there you have it. Rory Gallagher, solo artist and a member of the Taste. So, the second musician, um, I probably don't have as much interest in the music that he played in as the first guy. However, he's a more notable person, I think. Uh, oh, I flipped the wrong way. <laughs> Gotta go this way, not that way. Anyways, we're talking about Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, uh, born Jerome. Um, anyways, he was born August 1st, 1942 in San Francisco. He died August the 9th, 1995 at the age of 53 in Forest Knowles, California. So, I don't normally do this, but I usually talk about it at the end, but he was in rehab and had a heart attack. That's what happened to him. Okay, sorry. Oh, where did that come from? Um, his form of music, he was into just a lot of different stuff. Uh, rock, psychedelia, blues, folk, um, jam, country, jazz, uh, bluegrass, just about everything. Uh, rock and roll, of course. So, um, uh, played the guitar, pedal steel guitar, banjo, and of course he was the vocalist for the Grateful Dead. Uh, one of the vocalists, probably the main guy, I think. He's active from 1960 to 1995. Okay, had an older brother who um, who accidentally cut off the right hand, sorry, the middle finger, uh, two thirds, two thirds of his middle finger. In a wood cutting accident, I can just imagine what happened there. <laughs> uh, but he used that to his advantage, trying to, uh, you know, show kids in the neighborhood, you know, like makes him a bit of a celebrity. He liked attention, as do most rock musicians. So, anyways, um, he had a perplexity for um, <clears throat> saying, telling stories. I guess is the way to put it. Um, Apparently, he told everybody he was there when his dad died and all that, but uh, there's no evidence to support that. Um, many of the people there said he wasn't there. The newspaper uh, that reported his dad drowning uh, said that he was, that he listed the people that were there and he wasn't one of them. So, you know, he, he had this perplexity for telling a little bit of the stories and they, they went over that a couple times. So... But I'm not going to go into it because it doesn't really matter. He, we're here to discuss his music, really. So anyways, he... Um, okay, so they moved um, They moved several times. Once to a better neighborhood. And then uh, his mother uh, got the bar after his father died. So they moved to an a apartment above the new bar. Because they had to tear the other one down. They were doing something. And so... He lived there for a while, but it wasn't the best of neighborhoods, and he was getting into problems at school, so she took the whole clan and 
moved 90 miles north um, of San Francisco, and he went to a school about 30 kilometers away, which he, or 30 miles away, which he didn't really like. But he formed his first band there, and if I can, if I can get it right, uh, uh, where did I? I wrote it down here somewhere. Anyways, doesn't matter. He played in his first band there. They actually won a c contest and they, um, they, one of the things they got was to record some music. So it was kind of neat, eh? So, but anyways, eventually at some point he met, um, Hunter in April of, uh, 19, I'm going to say 1961 or 62, 61 or 62. And they began a lifelong writing and music, right? Cause, um, Hunter was the primarily primarily wrote the lyrics for uh, the Grateful Dead, so they they kind of had this writing thing going on that, between them. And then uh, at one point he met uh, uh, Pigpen and Weir Bob Weir, and the three of them decided to form a band, which they did with several others called the um, Mother McCreary's Uptown Dog. Um, jog uh champions that's what it was champions i've actually done this in a previous video for pig pen so if you want to go back that's a lot more detailed about that particular thing i don't want to repeat the same thing so anyways this band eventually uh evolved into the grateful dead and uh he was the lead guitarist and vocalist in that band he often shunned the title of being the leader of the band. He never really wanted to take that title on, although I essentially think he was the leader of the band. <laughs> However, he didn't he didn't want to take on the title. So anyways, uh, what happened is that, you know, you the, the Grateful Dead were, uh, you know, one of the most famous bands for one particular reason, and if for no other reason, it was a pretty important reason, they had the most loyal fans. Their fans are the the Deadheads, and uh, they're considered the most loyal fans of all rock bands, even more so than the the cult-like fans of Rush. <laughs> Anyways, um, he had acquired diabetes from you know eating habits, being overweight, and smoking, and all these lovely uh, things that he liked to do. And in 1986, he had a diabetic attack and went into a coma. And when he came out of the coma, he was never quite as healthy as he was going to be. He, he never quite fully recovered. So that when he went to treatment, or when he went to the rehab in 1995, he entered the rehab, um, you know, he was still having problems with all this stuff. And while he was in there, he had a heart attack and he passed away at the age of I think he was 52 I believe yeah 53 sorry so there you have it Gar Jerry Garcia so you know I think he was a huge influence on that particular style of music I'm not a huge fan of long jamming sessions and perhaps the reason why I probably don't listen to the Grateful Dead much I've, I have listened to them I had a friend Chris who uh, listened to them that was his favorite band so I got into them a little bit listening to that, but I never really found their music over appealing. But I can see the huge influence they have, and being being in that type of um, music frame, uh, there's a lot of people that really love them. So, anyways, there you have it: Jerry Garcia, Roy Gallagher um, for today's uh, series. Great rock artists who thrilled us, but have since passed on. Um, so some of the honorable mentions, you know, I, I could have went with a couple of these other people instead of one of these guys, but I just figured these two guys were probably the most notable ones, different genres and stuff too, so you got to listen to a few different things. So we have uh, Ribby Starr from the Black Oak, Arkansas, uh, Richie Edwards from the Manic Sh Street Preachers, Tony Secunda, manager of Motorhead and Moody Blues, and some others as well. Um, Ingo, and I'm going to get this name wrong, Sh Sherwitzenberg, Sherwitzenberg for Halloween. Uh, Melvin Franklin from The Temptations, 
Uh, that was a big name for me. Philip Taylor Kramer from the Iron Butterfly. Bob Stinson from the Replacements. And the other guy that uh, was originally going to go and I switched to Roy Gallagher was Peter Grant, uh, who worked with Zeppelin and the Stones and that uh, pretty influential work, um, manager, I think. Anyways, um, uh, Simone Ellison of Pariah, Daryl Robinson of Fat Boy. That was that's a that's a reference to a rap star of my daughter's friend is a rapper, so I wanted to give him some love too. Wolfman Jack, a disc jockey. Um, Alan McCarty of Men Without Hats. He was the keyboardist of that band. Ronald White of Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. Uh, Sterling Morrison of the Velvet Underground. And Clarence Satchel of the Ohio Players. And I also put in a personal a person who I long admired and uh listened to their music all the time it's not in the rock genre so i was originally going to not put it in here but um this person i i just love the way i, lo I love the whole vocal arrangement by the three and uh, we're talking about maxine andrews of the andrews sisters going back like to the 1940s anyway so there you have it there's my honorable mentions and there's probably some that i missed there was quite a few this year if if I didn't get to them, it wasn't because I didn't like them. It's just you can only put so many people on a page, you know. You can't name every single person. It's just too much. So if there are people you think should have been on this list or should be mentioned here, please mention them. Um, you know, I don't want to exclude anybody. You know, the, the whole reason to do this is to bring them back into the limelight to get people listening to their music so that they're not forgotten, you know. Gone but not forgotten. That was the title somebody else suggested for this show. I just decided that I like the one I have. So, anyways, there you go. There you have it. Uh, number, number, episode number 32 of the series of uh, Rock Stars Who Thrill Us But Has Since Passed On. So, I hope you enjoyed this. If you got any comments of your own, please leave them. Like, subscribe. Give me some love you back here so that I can keep going. Everybody needs encouragement, right? So, uh, so for tonight... You have a good night, and uh, this is Prog Monster out. Bye.